At the Battle of Antietam with the 8th Ohio Infantry, read before the commandery by 1st Lieutenant Thomas F. DeBerg Galway, U.S. Volunteers, December 1st, 1897. I intend in this paper to relate only that which fell within the range of my own personal experience or observation at the Battle of Antietam, and I have prepared it chiefly because I deem it a duty for every active participant in important events of the Civil War to put on record what he remembers that may be of value to the future historians of that struggle. Considered without regard to the strategy of the campaign of which it formed a part, the Battle of Antietam was a drawn battle, but considered merely as a fight, it was one of the fiercest and most persistent of modern times, and one of the fairest of the whole war. The numbers really opposed were altogether practically about even, and as to advantages of position, there was not on the whole much preponderance on either side. When I speak of the numbers, I am aware that it is easy to misunderstand the battle if one follows some of the written accounts because of the queer arithmetic, or vanity, or whatever motive or means it may be, that has in some of these accounts juggled with the estimate of numbers engaged. I say engaged, and it is just as well to keep in mind the simple fact that, ordinarily speaking, battles are fought not by those who are merely present at the fight, but that are present in the fight. Now at Antietam, though our army was probably more numerous than the Confederate army, there were thousands of our troops who were within range of the Confederate artillery, and yet did not fire a shot in all that long day. I'm not criticizing the battle, merely describing what I saw. The men who did not fight, or a large proportion of them, would have fought as well as those that did, but through no fault of theirs, they were not taken into the fight, or history might have had to be differently written. The 8th Ohio Infantry was a part of Kimball's brigade of French's division of Sumner's 2nd Corps. Generally, this brigade consisted of four regiments that began their field service in July 1861 in the West Virginia Campaign of that summer. The 4th Ohio, 8th Ohio, 14th Indiana, and 7th West Virginia. Their first brigade commander was General B.F. Kelly, a native West Virginian. Under him, in October 1861, they assaulted Romney and mounted the fastness and captured it with many prisoners, 12 pieces of artillery, and the entire wagon train of the enemy. An achievement that met recognition in the congratulatory order from General Winfield Scott said to have been the old man's last official order. Then they became the first brigade of that newly organized division, which under General Lander made the famous retreat from Romney in January 1862 in the midst of a dreadful storm, alternating between snow and rain and frost in which Stonewall Jackson was outwitted, and many of his men perished with the cold. Lander being then succeeded by General James Shields, the command of the brigade fell to Nathan Kimball, Colonel of the 14th Indiana, and afterwards a Brigadier General. It was Shields' division which at Cairnstown near Winchester in March 1862 inflicted upon Stonewall Jackson a square and unmistakable defeat. The only defeat in genuine fight ever suffered by the great Confederate. He was pursued after the battle and attacked by Shields day after day without respite, until the Washington people, believing Jackson to have been driven beyond need of further attention, sent Shields with a division to Fredericksburg to join McDowell. They are still ragged and barefoot from their long and arduous campaigning to pass in review before Lincoln. In humorous contrast with the tailor-made uniforms and varnished booties of McDowell's other divisions, only to be sent back in hot haste, still in rags and unshod, to meet Jackson again, now victorious over Banks, and begin once more the work of hunting the Virginian up the Shenandoah Valley. That done for some mysterious reason never fully or satisfactorily explained, Shields was retired from the command. The division was broken up, and Kimball's brigade was sent to the peninsula to join the main body of the Army of the Potomac, and shortly was attached to the 2nd Corps, and there remained to the end. At the Battle of Antietam, the 4th Ohio was absent, but a new regiment that had never been under fire, the 132nd Pennsylvania was attached to the brigade. The Second Corps became engaged between 8 and 9 o'clock on the morning of September 17th. It had been in bivouac on the eastern side of the Antietam Creek near the Keatesville Road since the 15th, when it had come from Turner's Gap in the South Mountain Range the day after the battle there. But the whole corps did not go in at once. During the night, orders were received in my regiment to be under arms at 3 o'clock, ready to move. But we did not move until 7, and by that time the fighting seemed already to be well underway beyond the high ground north of Sharpsburg. French's division in column of fours, or as we used to say then, in four ranks. Max Weber's brigade leading, then Morse's, then Kimball's, marched back to the Keatesville Road, and then filed off to the left, downhill to the creek and forded it, waist deep, just where Sedgwick's division had crossed before us. As second sergeant of the left company of the regiment, I was the last in my regiment on this short march to the creek. Just behind came the 132nd Pennsylvania, and its colonel's horse was close upon my heels. That colonel himself was discussing in a serious way with his adjutant, who rode beside him, the chances of coming out of the battle unscathed, all of which were mimicked by a little fellow of my company, a man of wild and lawless antecedents. 
The colonel's pious contention that one must do his duty under all circumstances, and then leave the rest of the province to God, and so forth, being jeered at by the scamp who ended his mockery by swearing, in the profane style that was his habit, that the bullet was not yet bolted that would do him harm. And that was true, for later in the day he was to fall in an ugly heap, the top of his skull cut clear off by a fragment of shell from the Dunker Church. And the Pennsylvania colonel was also to be among the slain of that day. A few hundred yards beyond the ford, Weber's brigade halted long enough to close up its length in ranks, then faced to the left and advanced in line of battle. And Morris's and Kimball's brigades did the same as they successively reached the same point. And thus French's division moved forward into action in three parallel lines of battle, separated from each other by a distance of about 200 yards. We moved in quick time and of course at first was through a fine oak wood. The wood was full of stragglers and there were some dead and many wounded were passing our rights towards the rear. We moved in very good order in spite of the trees, but when we emerged from the wood we came upon rolling ground strewn with huge boulders and masses of rock, witnesses of the glacial epoch so dear to the geologist. Sedgwick's division was already a good while engaged, and the smoke of their fighting was rising white and thick off to our right from front, and perhaps a mile or more away. It was to be for our side a day of fighting by detail. To our front, Weber's and Morse's brigades were in view and advancing in good style. We saw a few hundred yards ahead of us a cluster of farm buildings, an apple orchard just beyond, and beyond that again a slight but distinct bridge with a depression through it, and on the upward slope from the depression a cornfield clear to the farthest crest of the ridge and reaching out to our right of the farm buildings, which were known as roulettes, another cornfield. To our left front, farther on that than roulettes' houses, and detached on this side of the ridge was a considerable eminence, which seemed to overlook all the land in sight, and this and the ridge formed for us just then, and for most of French's division during the entire battle, the background of the picture, above which were the blue sky and the fleecy clouds of that bright and warm September day. This is probably not a description that will fit in with the topographical map leisurely drawn by surveyors, but it is the picture that then was formed upon the retina of my young eye and became fixed in my memory as we saw Weber's regiments, which had now passed beyond the orchard and were near the foot of the low crest that runs along this side of the depression, breaking up into small groups, and a line of Confederates in butternut with red-looking flags advancing from the depression over the low crest upon Weber's men and firing into them. Just then there came in the front, the right, from behind where Sedgwick was engaged, the shattered remnant of another Ohio regiment that belonged to Mansfield's Corps. The colonel of the 8th Ohio at this time was Samuel Sprigg Carroll, who died about three years ago in his home in Washington, a major general on the retired list of the army. But at this time he was detached from us, in command of another brigade, and was not to return to us until after the Battle of Fredericksburg, where Kimball was disabled by a severe wound. Carroll was a great fighter, one of the best in the Army of the Potomac, but he was also a fine tactician, not only on the drill ground, but also more particularly under fire in the crisis of battle. In the times that tried men's souls, and God knows his brigade often experienced such times, Carroll was not only in the midst of it, but could be seen by all the brigade whenever there was stress of fighting, and every officer and man knew that Carroll would see him. But if Kimball was not a tactician, he had heart and great intelligence. He made us a little speech at Roulette's Farm, the substance of which was, Boys, we are going for the Johnnies now, and we'll stay with them all day if necessary. We sprang to our feet from the ground, where we had halted and moved forward, halting again, but for a moment or two only, in the orchard to unsling our knapsacks, which we left on the grass there under the trees. On our left was a road running towards the ridge. As we pressed on, we were ordered to wheel slightly to the left, so as to come in on our left of the Weber's line, and we struck obliquely, therefore, upon this road, which was enclosed on both sides by neatly painted board rail fences that had to be climbed, so there was not time to pull them down. Being the extreme left-hand man of the front rank of the 8th Ohio, I was the first to reach each of these fences successively, and thus rose twice into undesirable prominence for a mere second sergeant. Two or three days before, I had drawn a new haversack, and that style of haversack, as you know, was made with a strap long enough for a seven-footer, so that I had taken in the slack with a big knot. When I struck the first of these fences, my little store of hardtack, salt pork, coffee, etc., was in its place, but as I was straddling the top of the second fence, a whirr like a bumblebee's flitted past my ear, and a weight fell from my shoulder. Some so-called sharpshooter had missed me, but his bullet had cut the big knot of my haversack strap and thus parted me from my rations forever. On account of our slight left wheel, my own company had nearly all passed over to our left of this road by the time we arrived at the first crest of the ridge, while the rest of the regiment extended out to the right, to the right of that being the 14th Indiana. At this time, somewhere about nine in the morning, Kimball's brigade was in compact line of battle in two ranks so far as the right wing of the brigade, the 14th Indiana and the 8th Ohio. The left wing was also 
to our left of this road. The 7th West Virginia somewhat refused, or bent back to the rear. Though it was afterwards, I believe, I do not remember when or how, shifted altogether from the left flank, while the 132nd Pennsylvania was placed in echelon in rear of the left flank. This formation was adopted because there were no troops of ours on our left then, nor for some time afterwards. As we came up, the Confederates fell very quickly back and disappeared down to an old rain-worn lane that ran along the through the depression of the ridge. This is the famous sunken or bloody lane, out of which after the battle, the bodies of several hundreds of Confederate dead were removed by our men for burial. We halted upon the slight crest upon which we had first seen the Confederates appear in their attack upon Weber's men. We had a plunging fire into the lane, which looked to us then like a mere ditch and was distant about 50 or 60 yards. The lane came down from higher ground from the direction of the Dunkard Church towards our right front and in front of us seemed to be at its lowest, and then to rise slightly again in the other direction towards our left front. At our left front, a zigzag rail fence ran from the lane at right angles up to the slope, on our left of the cornfield there, the cornfield being directly in front of us. When we first reached this position on the slight crest, that corn was standing, and about the height of a man, and would partially conceal troops in it, if they would keep down and remain still. You will pardon me for being particular about some of these details. There is much dispute and much of of the printed accounts as to what troops of both sides were engaged in the neighborhood of the sunken lane. The author of what is perhaps the best known account from the Federal side, General Palfrey in his work, The Antietam and Fredericksburg, seems to regard the sunken lane as a great puzzle, and if I mistake not, it has not yet, after all these years, been determined precisely what Confederate troops took part in the fighting at this point. We thought the Confederates, in taking refuge in that lane, had put themselves into a sort of a trap, for the ground behind them on which the corn grew was a steep rise, and though we could see that they had reinforcements in that corn, there appeared to be hesitation among them. We halted where we did without orders, just as all the troops advancing under fire will do when they come to a slight swell in the ground, a fence, a ditch, or any other temporary advantage for a firing line. We had no orders to halt, it is true, but it is also true that not at least for some time after did we have an order to go on. At all events, we settled down right there on the grass, our men bestowing themselves as best they could to fire most effectively sitting kneeling or lying down. There were Confederate battle flags at intervals in the sunken lane, six or seven, I think along our front at one time, and more in the cornfield behind, indicating, I suppose, just so many regiments. The fence on this side of the lane had been pulled down, and the rails were piled up along this edge. On the other side of the lane, the fence, a common snake or zigzag fence, was still standing at first, but later on I recollect noticing that it was nearly all down. It is almost certain that for a very short while after our arrival we could have carried the lane and the slope beyond by a dash, but the Confederates in the lane manifested no disposition to attack. It was only rarely that a head could be seen above the pile of rails, though on the several occasions within the first hour when our men, by their own impulse rather than by any concerted action or authoritative command, rose from the recumbent firing position and fixed bayonets to charge, the Confederates showed themselves plainly enough to, and met us with a murderous fire. It was about this time that I noticed that the Confederates in the cornfield were no longer visible. Perhaps they were withdrawn, but the minute slipped by and the good opportunity was gone. It is difficult to take account of time in the heat of battle. Minutes may seem like hours, or hours like minutes. But it was not very long until it looked as if it might be a question whether we could hold the ground which we had so easily taken, but had already lost so severely to keep. Down over the crest and through the tall corn, we saw it was probably a brigade, several lines, five or six according to my observation and recollection, each with its battle flag descending into the lane, and there disappearing for a small fraction of time. Then the musketry from the lane, which had been intermittent before, broke out into a loud roar, and from that on until the end of the fighting at this point was, with a few intervals, steady and destructive. During all the time of this fight, the sunken lane, my company were mostly perched upon a little knoll to the left, as I before described it, of the road running to the lane. Just across to the right of the road, and a little to the front of the fence that ran along there and gave us, as it were, the general alignment to the 8th Ohio, were two or three trees, and under these trees, but in front of their trunks, the two stands of colors of the regiment were for those three hours or more waved by their bearers. Both members of my company, both exceedingly brave and daring men, and neither of them was so much as hit upon that day, despite their long continued and most conspicuous exposure of themselves, for the colors they bore were shot through and through many times. I can see another sergeant in my company even now, as I fancy kneeling upon the grass on the farthest out point of the knoll, loading and firing with slow and grim humor. The blood from an ugly flesh wound trickled down and reddened the powder grime in his face, but he paid no heed to the advice to keep back a little out of sight, and only relaxed from his careful loading and firing to take now and then a fresh chew of tobacco. My captain was off to the right for a good part of the time, acting as major, and both of our lieutenants were by this time mortally hurt. One killed outright, the other carried off to die in lingering pain at the rear. The heads of white clover were quivering in the grass about me, and when I exclaimed to one of my men, See the crickets jump? 
He thought I was joking and burst out laughing, and I very soon perceived that the crickets were bullets. I have read somewhere a Confederate account of the battle in which it is said that one thin line of Confederates, without reinforcements, held the sunken lane all that morning against the Yankees. But that is mere Southern romance. Besides the reinforcements I have mentioned, at least once again that morning more Confederates came down through the cornfield and disappeared into the lane. And another point I wish to make while I'm at it, later on, when we ascended that cornfield, as I shall describe, the corn stalks were nearly all trodden down, but let that pass for the moment. It was a mystery to us at the time, and has been ever since, how such numbers as we saw come down the slope could be disposed of in that lane, not to speak of those who occupied the lane when we first arrived. The great numbers of dead in the lane will partially explain it, it is true. Hundreds of perhaps ran away, wounded or not. During all those hours, there was not a moment that I could not see numbers of men hastening away upon through that cornfield. And there was an almost unbroken string of men in single file for nearly all that time running along up a, by the zigzag fence. Some of these, perhaps a considerable proportion, were wounded. Some limped, some crawled. Many who were probably not wounded actually leaped. The men of my company at least abstained from firing at those that seemed to be wounded. And then my regiment, as described presently, took about 300 prisoners. But after all these allowances, the mystery of that awful sunken lane still seems unexplained. There was a time when a sudden lull occurred in the Confederate fire from the lane, and then at one moment, we saw perhaps a dozen little white squares rise above the fence rails. Whether they were white handkerchiefs, a luxury hardly to be expected then and there, or the white cotton haversacks used to the Confederates, we could not distinguish. This was up the lane, or rather opposite the right wing of my regiment, in the 14th Indiana perhaps. It seemed to mean desire for surrender, and our brigade line advanced and it was at this time that the 300 prisoners referred to above were scooped in by the right of my regiment. Just how I do not know, though. I remember well seeing the great crowd of long, lank North Carolinians going off to the rear a few minutes after under the guard of Captain Miller and his company of the 8th Ohio. It was quickly plain that though there might be some in the lane who wished to surrender, these were in the minority, but we met a musketry fire so rapid and well-aimed that we all unfixed bayonets and backed up step by step until we were on the old ground, where we dropped down again and resumed our fire as before. The waving the battle flags on the opposing lines was a feature that struck me more at Antietam than anywhere else in the war. Perhaps the first man killed in the Union side of Antietam was a color bearer of my regiment. He was struck by a cannon shot while holding his colors in the line at the opening of the sudden Confederate cannonade in the morning of the 16th, while we were drawn up in columns of brigades closed in mass, and out of sight, as we supposed, from the enemy's artillery. The vacancy was instantly sought for and obtained by a young corporal of my company as a soft snap. And during all those terrible morning hours in front of the sunken lane, he and another of my company, carrying the two colors of the regiment, were from first to last constantly visible to the enemy, sometimes kneeling or sitting down, but a good portion of the time standing up on their two feet, and entirely waving the colors to and fro, a threat to the enemy and encouragement to their comrades. But there was a Confederate battle flag that was just as persistently waved, though not for so long, perhaps. For about two hours, at least, it waved at the angle where the zigzag rail fence ascended the slope from the lane, opposite to, but somewhat to our left of the position of my company on the knoll. I do not remember that its bearer was once in our sight. He probably kept close to the ground in the corner of the fence. Time and again, a group of my company would aim together and pull trigger the base of the flagstaff, and now and again that flag would go down with a triumphant war whoop of our part. But it always rose again, sometimes after an interval, and my last recollection connected with it is that it was still waving. For what seemed like an hour after our arrival on the ground, we were all alone. We could look far to the rear, but no Union troops were in sight and we were now sadly in need of some relief. Our numbers were reduced, our ammunition was running low, our men had all begun with 60 rounds, and they now endeavored to economize their cartridges and to gather more from the cartridge boxes on the ground belonging to the dead or wounded. Richardson's division at length came up on our left, and the Irish brigade of that division came into close touch with us, the orderly sergeant of the right company of the 88th New York, kneeling down. I remember, just at my left shoulder, and banging away at the enemy. He was a red-headed, red-bearded man, and the whole circumstances impressed on my mind from the fact that he put his hand into the haversack of a dead Confederate, whose body lay on the grass in front of both of us, and took therefrom a bag of coffee, which he kept for himself, handing me a bag of sugar, which I accepted, only to recollect that my haversack had been shot away, and so I gave the sugar to another. The Confederate artillery off towards the Duncan Church had found our line with their shots and were enfilading us from right to left. Our pressed men will always complain, and our men would then complain, that there was no artillery support for Kimball's brigade. Many times I heard a curse because no battery had yet been run up to the commanding eminence that I mentioned was to the left, and slightly to the rear of our line. Later on, Pleasanton put one of his horse batteries up there, but by that time our struggle was nearly at an end. But as the sun approached its noon height, how the heavens did ring with the peal of artillery and the roar of musketry, and we knew by the din, and by the yelling and cheering of troops out of sight, that the fighting was fierce elsewhere as with us. Noon came and went, and we had not yet made 
headway. The many times we fixed bayonets, dressed our line as well as we could, and rushed towards the lane, but in each of these efforts, the Confederates rose from their cover and drove us back to our old position by their killing rain of musket balls. Our solid line of battle had now become reduced to a mere thin line of skirmishers. The rest of our comrades lay about us on the grass, wounded or dead, or had gone disabled to the rear. It seemed as if we could not endure it much more. We must go forward or else altogether abandon the ground. To our rear was nothing in Richardson's division had moved and left nothing on our left. It was about this time that the captain of my company appeared from the right, passing the order along the line as he approached. Fix bayonets, battalion forward, right wheel, double quick. And the word of execution, march, he spoke as soon as he reached us on the knoll. Whether Captain Kenny originated that order or merely communicated it from another, I never knew. I know he was the only one that gave it to us, or to any of the other regiments I ever heard, and I know that, though not an educated man, he must have inherited the instincts of a race of warriors, and that he had a natural aptitude for tactics, and like Samuel Sprig Carroll, and the two men so different in many respects, and so alike in others, were much attached to each other. It was when my face to face with the enemy that his aptitude as a tactician showed to the best advantage. The Confederates had broken through the line to the right of the 14th Indiana, into the cornfield there. It was a good thing for us to have a voice of command that we could hear, and the order was obeyed at once. It seemed like merely a hop, skip, and jump till we were at the lane, and into it the Confederates breaking away in haste and fleeing up the slope. What a sight was that lane. I shall not dwell on the horror of it. I saw many a ghastly array of dead afterwards, but none, I think, that so affected me as did the sight of the poor brave fellows in butternut humspun that had there died for what they believed to be honor and a righteous cause. We clambered forward up to the steep slope on the trodden stalks, wheeling as we went to the right, until a mere group of us, at the left of the line, stood upon the crest of that ridge and saw just below a farmhouse, and beyond that, Sharpsburg. Our right wheel was intended to be an attack upon the right flank of those Confederates who were advancing into the cornfield to our right of the orchard, and Roulette's farm buildings. But we were now evidently too weak for the work cut out for us. Before we had completed the wheel, the right of our brigade had begun to fall back towards those buildings, and the withdrawal extended towards the right of the 8th Ohio. When we could see the Confederates pouring over through the cornfield towards our right rear, a force of them stringing themselves out along a wall, from which they were firing to the remnant of Kimball's brigade that was passing them in retreat. We had but three or four cartridges apiece, and we numbered fifty or sixty, those of us who were still on the crest, and we started back in a huddle, but slowly and then, stretching out in single file, we went back by the same row which my company had crossed obliquely about four hours before, and kept ourselves as well as we could close to the still standing fence on the side towards the enemy. They peppered us unmercifully and jived and mocked us in our humiliation, as we, who had shortly before believed ourselves within reach of victory, crouched and slunk down that lane. We turned to the row behind Roulette's barn and threw ourselves upon the ground where the rest of the brigade had gathered, and were getting their second wind and receiving fresh ammunition. The brigade of the Sixth Corps, Vermont Brigade, we then understood, was just then moving into the cornfield on our right, with full cartridge boxes, and they quickly put a check to the Confederate advance there. It was while standing about at our ease at Roulette's barn that I got an effective lesson in the beauty of politeness. I had stepped forward to sit down in a part of the stone wall where the upper stones had fallen out, but as I did so, another man moved in the same direction with the same intent. While we were both, in an impulse of self-denial and good nature, each bowing to the other to take the seat, a Confederate twelve-pound round shot struck the smooth spot that we had both picked out, and ricocheting off, landed on a low ridge to our right rear in the midst of an advancing column of fours of Sixth Corps, throwing the dust far up into the air and leaving an opening among the files. Early afternoon we were placed in position in a ravine that led towards the right from Roulette's barn, and there lay down behind the fence the rear of the cornfield as a support for the six corps troops there engaged, and for the rest of the day took our share of such of the Confederate projectiles as missed the brave, staunch, ever-reliable six corps men. Before I close, I desire to say that my account is in some respects probably in conflict with a good deal that has been printed with regard to the part of the Battle of Antietam in question. Yet it should be said that most of the printed accounts are curiously vague as to what was done by Kimball's brigade. No doubt, however, the board appointed by the War Department under authority of Congress to mark out in the Antietam battlefield the positions of the various commands will clear up many obscure points. But I deem it my duty in the interest of the truth of history to dissent to some extent from the account of Antietam by General Palfrey, to which I have referred. General Palfrey, it appears, was wounded early in the forenoon and, being of Cedric's division, could not in any case have had personal knowledge of what he describes concerning French's division. I will quote one passage here it is, page 94. There is no doubt that French's division did some very severe fighting and met and repulsed successive attacks on its left, front, and right, but it did not succeed in driving the Confederates out of the old road. By the old road, General Palfrey, as he elsewhere explains, means what is generally called the sunken or bloody road or lane. The smartest push made by the Confederates was on Kimball's left, and Kimball's losses were very heavy, amounting to about 700 out of about 1,403 of his regiments. 
the 8th Ohio, 132nd Pennsylvania, and 14th Indiana. Their gallant fighting did not accomplish much, as Federal and Confederate accounts agreed that they finally took position behind the crest of a hill which looked down upon the old road. The Confederates had great advantage of position as the old road and the rails piled before it placed them as it were in a fort, and they got some guns into a place from which they were able to partially enfilade the line. So far, General Palfrey, as I think I have shown the position of the 8th Ohio at least was not behind the crest, but upon it, that of my own company, Company B on a knoll somewhat above the crest. I have shown also that we drove out of the sunken road all the Confederates who were not dead or unable to escape. As to what was accomplished by the fighting Hibble's brigade, I do not believe that any one is accomplished to say, but to say that it did not accomplish much is certainly unreasonable, as will appear to anyone who, with some knowledge of the facts, attempts to answer the question. What would have been the result if Kimball's men had not fought gallantly all the forenoon at the Battle of Antietam?